Well, he's still on the throne. No matter what's going on in the world, uh, he's, still, he's still exactly where he's supposed to be. And he's still in the right timeline to do what he's going to do. You don't have to lose hope. You don't have to get scared. And uh, you don't have to build a bunker and get in it. You're, you're going to be okay. And we're all going to be okay. And we're going to make it to the end. And uh, it may get weird, but we're going to get there. Philippians chapter number uh, 1. Philippians chapter number 1. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'd like to continue the thought that we had this morning. And, uh, and, and I think if we can do it in quick succession like this, you'll be able to pick up on the flow of what he's trying to do. You know, whenever I finally figured out that, that the Bible is intended to, to have a context, it really helped me a lot. And um, when I originally, when I just thought, well, this, all these words are kind of floating somewhere and you can grab them and just use them to say whatever you want to say, well, that made for easier preaching, uh, but not responsible preaching. And, um, and so then when you start realizing they all fit together and they were written for a purpose, and each thought goes into the next thought, well, then now it makes the Bible come alive to you. And, um, and so what we read this morning is, is Paul is, again, in Philippians chapter 1, he started this thing off with saying, look, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And I said, he really had three things that were his motivations. One of them was, I'm a servant. I'm a servant of the gospel. And then he, his, one of his motivations were the saints, to all the saints. And then twice in there he talks about, Jesus Christ or uh, Christ Jesus. And so I, I said that there was three things that were his view in life. One was, I'm a servant. Two, it's about the saints and it's about the Savior. And if, you're, if your motivation, if your viewpoint is that in life, that what I'm doing is about serving, what I'm doing is about others, about the saints, what I'm doing is about glorifying the Savior. If that becomes your motivation in life, then that makes life pretty simple. It's, that's the simple focus. And again, we've talked about how this, the, when you look at the themes in here, one of the themes over and over again, I think, it was, I think I counted it was 98 times Jesus or Lord or Christ or some form of that was used in this little four chapter little epistle. And so you had Jesus Christ. One of the other focus we're going to read some of it today is the mind. And then the other overall theme that people have always said about Philippians is joy. And we said it this morning that if you can keep your mind focused on Jesus Christ, you can have joy. And that's kind of what this book is, is doing. And so Paul in prison, we talked about that this morning. We went through detail about that. So Paul's in prison. And um, as he's in prison, they've sent somebody to him to be a strength to him. He's now sent them, them back with a letter to let them know exactly how he's doing. Remember I said it would be odd for them to think, look, when you came here and started this church in Philippi, you ended up in jail. You sang praises one night, and the jail was open, and you were able to come out. In fact, Philippian jailer, whatever his, his real name is, um, this man's a founding member of our church because he was the jailer that day that the Lord broke you out. So why isn't the Lord breaking you out now? And, uh, and so he's written a letter to tell them that, look, I, I am, I'm in prison, and as I'm in prison, I'm still joyful. And one of the ways I'm going to have joy is I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about you people. And that's the first part of, of chapter number one we, we, we talked about down to verse number 11. He says, I just think about you a lot. I think about your past, where you started, where you are now, and where you will be in the future, and how I hope that you will abound. I, I think a lot about you, and you bring me joy even though I'm in prison. That's what he's talking about. And then he starts going into chapter 12. He says, now, when it comes to the fact that I'm in prison, I want you to know that what's happening to me, being in confinement in these chains, they're really, it's really happening to further the gospel. And he says, you're looking at it like, man, I can't believe Paul's in prison. And Paul's saying, look, the gospel is spreading like wildfire because I'm in prison. He's saying that there are people, he talks about it, I think it's chapter number four, he talks about people, uh, we, the salute you, the people of the household of Caesar. How in the world does Caesar's household now a Christian? How are they saved? Because Paul was in bonds there. God's doing something through Paul, even in the midst of what seemed to be a real difficult time. And so I preached to you this morning about the perspective he had, even though he was in a difficult time. He said, these chains, this confinement, they're not going to stop me. I'm set for the gospel. These people that are, that are saying things to try to add stripes to my back, they're not going to move me. My life is about glorifying God. Even though I don't know how the outcome is going to be, I'm still going to just follow all the way. Whether it's in life or whether it's death, it's all about glorifying Him, he says. And then you get to verse number 27. 
And now what he's going to do, he's going to give them a charge. And that's why I titled this A Joyful Purpose. He's talked about the people. He's talked about his perspective. And now he's going to talk about your purpose, their purpose, and, and ultimately your purpose. What are you supposed to do? Look at verse number 27. We'll read 27 down through 30, and we'll probably just kind of touch into chapter number 2 a little bit. He says, only let your conversation, what he's been talking about up to this point is what he's been having to do. He's given a kind of a testimony of what his life has been. Now he's going to tell them what they should be doing. Only let your conversation, and what's conversation? It's how you carry yourself. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Great little statement there. Maybe hard to understand. I'll explain it in a minute. But only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you, if I do get out of this prison, or else be absent, they take my life. I may hear of your affairs that you, watch this now, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing, watch this now, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is them an evident token of perdition. These people that are doing this to you said the same thing. Remember again, these people are the same people of Macedonia. He wrote to the people of Thessalonica and said the same type of thing to them. There's people that are troubling you. There's people that are hurting you. And he says, I'm telling you, God will trouble them one day. It's an evident token of perdition. But of you, of salvation and not of God. As, as you watch, as you're, he's summoned, as they go through this world, as they're going through the th- trouble they're going through, they, the contrast between those that hate God and hate Christianity and want to tear everything down that's right, standing up against those that are standing for God and living for God, boy, it's a stark tri- a contrast there. And when you look at it, it's an evident token that they're on the wrong track and that you are on the right track. He says, for unto you it is given on behalf of Christ Watch this now. I want you to understand this truth. It's given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him. Hey, I I hope everybody in here has believed on Him. But watch, but also to suffer for His sake. Yeah, I got a calling. What's my calling? Get saved. What else? Suffer. He said in Timothy, he said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus, they're going to suffer persecution. Hey, listen, if you will live godly, you're going to face some trouble. Now, if you, if you live like the rest of this world, you can go right with the flow. But if you live different, contrary to this world, you're going to suffer some things. And he says this, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Remember what, what they saw in him? And he was in Philippi. They saw it with their own eyes. You know what they're hearing now? They're hearing how he's in prison now. And all this is simply because he's taking a stand for Christ. So I'm going to go back and look at this, and I want you to see some things about what, what he's, he's telling them to have some things here. I want to give you a few points to some things to look at. Number one is their conversation. Their conversation. What is this conversation? He, he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Well, that's a great statement. Conversation is this, your attitude, your desires, your speech, your actions, your thoughts, your motives, your dreams. Basically, it is who you are, your character. Let your character, let, let how you live your life, let it be the gospel. What's the gospel? You might know the gospel. The gospel is what? The, the death. What is it? The burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What did you have to believe to be saved? First Corinthians 15 says you believe the gospel. What's the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, he says, let your character, let your lifestyle, let your habits, let your speech, your actions, your thoughts, your desires, your dreams, let everything about you, your conversation, be the gospel. What an interesting statement. Live your life, let, let, let your life resemble the gospel. What does that mean? That means that, that the day I got saved, the day that I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, that was the day that Eric Knight, the old man, died. He died, he was buried. And he rose again in a new life with Jesus Christ. That's who I am now. You've read the verse before in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, what a great statement. This church, if you've been here for any amount of time, you've heard us exhaust that phrase, in Christ. If any man be, what? In Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The day that I got saved, that old man died and I became new. And old things passed away and all things became new. What was becoming new? I got a new home. I got a new, I got a new home. I'm no longer, this is no longer my home. My home's in glory. That's where I'm headed one day. I got a new home. I got a new name. I got a new life. I got a new course of life. I got new affections, new loves. Now, hopefully, if you're saved, that's true for you. Living out the gospel. I want you to go with me. Just, we're going to take a, a little journey off course here and, and look at what it means to live out the gospel. Look at Romans chapter number 6 with me. Romans chapter 6. And just understand this idea of living out the gospel. And then uh, we'll, we'll try a couple more verses, nail that idea down, because that's going to be crucial to the rest of what he's going to tell them to do. Romans chapter 6, and then if you've been in the Romans class or you've been in here, we were preaching the Romans, of course, Romans chapter 1, you're a sinner. Romans chapter 2, even the self-righteous, they're sinners. By the time you get to chapter 3, all have sinned. He's telling everybody's a sinner. Chapter 4 is that everything hinges on faith. Chapter 5, you got to put your faith in Jesus Christ who died for us and God committed His love toward us. That's what your faith goes in. And if you will put your faith in that, then all your sins are forgiven. And then he starts chapter 6 and says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. Watch. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now watch what he says. Know you not, don't you know? Know you not that so many of us as were, now this is a great phrase, and it'll take a little bit of a deep dive for just a second, we'll come back up. It says, as many of us as were baptized, what is that next phrase? It's four little letters, what does it say? All right, let's read it again. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized, what's the word? Into, into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Now, I'm just going to, I'll say this, I'll try to explain this. There's messages we've done, several of them. This is not talking about when you got baptized in water. Amen. There are different baptisms in the New Testament that are, it's so plain, you could not miss it unless you wanted to miss it. There's more than one baptism in the New Testament. There's a baptism of suffering that Jesus says that people would be baptized with. Baptism of suffering that's not water. When his disciples ask him, say, well, can we be baptized with a baptism that you're baptized with? And he says, you shall. They had already been baptized in water. That's different. So right from there, you can know there's more than one. Paul, I mean, uh, uh, John says, hey, I baptize in water, but when it comes after me, who's mightier than I, I'm not even worthy to latch the, his, his sandals. He baptizes with the Holy Ghost and the fire. There's three in that verse. Now we've, we've just hit four. Four different bat There's different baptisms. Baptism means to be immersed into something. So when you read the word baptism, sometimes what we do is we automatically read water into everything, but it doesn't always mean water. It means to be immersed into. Immersed into what? Immersed into suffering. Being plunged into suffering. Immersed into water. In this case, I'm being immersed into what? I've been baptized into who? I'm being immersed into Christ. That's what this is talking about. And he says, and you were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. You see what he's saying here? The moment I got saved, the old me right then was placed in Christ, and I was dead with Christ, and I was buried, and I rose up new, victorious, to walk in a new life with Jesus Christ. That's who you are. He says, don't you know that? Don't, he's talking to this church and says, don't you know it? That that's who you are now? The old John Pike's dead. Did you trust Christ as your Savior, John? The old John Pike died the day you trusted Christ as your Savior. You know what's even better? He ain't just hanging around. He was buried. You know what you got? You got a new John Pike that rose with Jesus Christ. You know what? Now you didn't have the power. All you had the power to do was walk like an old man before. Now you've got the power through the Holy Spirit living in you to walk like the new man you are in Christ. That's who you are now. That's who we're supposed to be. He says, don't you know that? 
This is the God, living out the gospel is you, rec- listen, now you recognizing who you are. Your old man is dead. Your old man's buried. Your, your new man is alive. And now you say, I just don't know if I have the power to walk like Christ. Yes, you do. If you've got Christ in you and you do have Christ and you've been placed in him, you absolutely can live the Christian life. You can live the Christian life. He said, you can walk in a new life. We were planted together in the likeness of his death. We also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing, he says knowing and then knowing again, knowing this, that our old man is crucified. That's who he is. He is crucified. I've got that circled twice in my Bible and underlined. He is crucified. Chris, the old man is crucified. That's where he is right now. Where's Chris? He's crucified. On the cross with Jesus Christ. Buried. Gone. Who's sitting here now? The new Chris. That's who we are. You better get in your mind who you really are. If you can ever get who you are, it'll affect what you do. And so he said in verse number six, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, from now on, henceforth, we should not serve sin. Now we don't, we don't serve it anymore. We serve something new. Henceforth, we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. This is, this, is the, this is the crux of the whole idea of living out the gospel. The old man's dead, the old man's buried, the new man's alive. Start walking like it. Verse number 9, knowing again, he says, Know ye not, knowing this, and then knowing that, Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died once. He died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Paul said in Philippians, he said, hey, for me to live is Christ. So then he says this, knowing, knowing, knowing. Verse number 11, likewise, what's that next word? Reckon, believe it. Reckon is is a word like saying, account it to be so. How many of you, listen real close. How many of you are saved today? All right. So that means if you're saved, according to what the Bible says, you need to know, 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 old man's dead. Matthew, old man's dead. Old man's buried. New Matthew's risen up, right? You need to know that. The problem is most of you don't believe it. That's the problem. If you would ever get to where you start believing it, it would change what you do. Because whatever you, if I can get you to believe something... I can get you to start doing something. Is that what, is that what gaslighting is? Yeah. yeah. If I can get you to believe something, I'm gaslighting you a little bit, I guess. Paul was the first gaslighter. I don't know, maybe that's what it was. <laughs> Trying to get you to believe something. He said, don't you know it? Know it? Know it? That's the truth. But you know what you need to do? Here's the problem people have. You better reckon it to be so. Yes, you better start believing it. Because what you keep doing is you keep saying, I know that old man's dead, but man, I keep letting him get up and run, and run my life. You need to believe it. He's dead. You believe it, and then you need to reckon it to be so. Reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin. You're dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's living out the gospel. And he says this, let not sin therefore, in light of all that, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither, and here's the last one I want you to get, look at verse number 13, neither, say the next word, yield your members, ye your members, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but, what's what's the next word, but what? Yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know what you need to do? You need to know it. 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 If you know it, then you need to believe it to be so. Reckon it to be so. 
If, I can, if we can ever get you to know it and then to believe it to be so, you know what next we can get you to do? Yield yourself to it. See, what you keep doing, this is why you keep get, having so much trouble, is because you keep yielding to your flesh instead of yielding to the spiritual man. You know why? It's a mind problem. That's what Philippians is about. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. You start thinking the right way. If we can never get your mind tuned the right way, your body will follow. Wherever your head goes, your body's... I mean, any of you guys that do fighting, if you can get the head going a different direction, the body's going to go that direction. They tell you in, in defense, if you can get somebody's... When they're trying to lift you up or do something, if you can push their head in a direction, their body's going to go in that direction. Where a head goes, the body goes. Where your head is at... That's where you will be. Yeah. Amen. Paul knew that yes, sir. because the Spirit knew that. He said, what do you believe right here? Listen, folks, what do you believe right here? You believe the gospel, that you are living out the gospel? Start, listen, you know it. Everybody in here knows these truths. You know it. You know it just as good as I know it. Problem is you ain't believing it. Because if you believe it, you start yielding yourself to it. You get some victory in your life. And so he's saying, live this out. Look at Romans chapter 12 real quick with me. Just go, go over there and look very quickly. Living out the God, let your conversation, your desires, your, your life, everything about you, your speech, let it be the gospel. Well, what does that mean, preacher? It means the old you's dead, buried, and you've got a new you. I tell you, if you would get that, we're talking about a joyful purpose. If you would ever get a hold of it, there'd be more joy in our life. Look, he says in Romans number 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, in light of all the mercies you've been shown and all the verses leading up to this point, he says that you present your body as a living sacrifice. You know, my body is dead, buried, sacrificed to him. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world. I no longer have any business with letting the world dictate who I am, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Your mind, what is, where's, the, where's the issue at? It's where? It's right here in your mind. How many of you are saved? Yeah. All right, you better start getting your mind wrapped around it. If you can never get your mind wrapped up, you know what? You can stop being like the world and start being like God. Now, let me say this to you because it's worth saying. This goes a whole lot deeper than where your hair is parted or your, your denim or whatever. It goes a whole lot deeper than that. I know for years, we've, that's all we've ever heard, but I'm telling you, it goes a whole lot deeper than that. If you look at it in that context, what he's going to talk about is you humbling yourself and figuring out where you fit within the body of Christ and your spiritual gifts. And then just travel down. Just look at this really quick with, with me. Look at verse number, uh, verse number nine. Look at that. So I'm going to read the rest of this chapter. I want you to see what a person that truly understands who they are and is now living out because their mind is different, living it out, what it's going to look like. Let's look at it, what it says. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and, and honor. Watch this. Preferring one another. He's going to say that in Philippians. He's going to talk about not being in, in vain glory, but esteeming other better than your own self. You know what? If you were really living out the gospel, you know what you would do? It'd be more about others than it would be about you. If we're really living the gospel... Yeah, but others. Now I'm going to ask you, how many of us are living the gospel? So watch what he says. Kindly affection one to another, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them that which persecute you. I'm telling you that if we truly got a hold of who we're supposed to be, we would be so different than the rest of this world. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Man, we got to live out the gospel. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in thine own conceits. Recompense to no evil, no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, 
as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. And for in so doing, thou shalt eat coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil. I'm telling you, be not overcome with evil. Don't let evil overcome you. But overcome evil with what? Say it, with good. That's what, that's what Christianity is supposed to look like. Listen, that's what Victory Baptist Church is supposed to look like. How do we do that? We've got to live out the gospel. I can turn you to so many places. You can look at Ephesians 2 and see it in Ephesians 4 and talk about the new life we're living and, and how we used to steal, but now we're using our hands to give to people. And we used to speak filthy, but now we're edifying each other with our, our mouth. There's a difference now in who we are. We're different because we're in Christ. We're different. Because the old me is dead and buried, and the new me is resurrected. Living out the gospel. He tells him in Colossians chapter 3, he says, If you be risen with Christ, how many of you are risen with Christ? Yes, Set your affections on things above. Mortify the deeds of this flesh. That's what living out the gospel is. Look back at Philippians chapter number 1. That's what living out the gospel is. And he says, let your conversation be the gospel. I'm telling you, I'm looking at the stuff that's going on in the world today. And uh, I don't know, I've felt, I, I don't know if it's just lately. I told Stacy a couple times this week, I've felt like really stirred in my spirit about what's happening. I mean, stirred where I feel saddened, greatly saddened. Not like just saddened as in like, man, I'm really upset, saddened. I'm talking about weeping saddened. When I watch uh, President Biden on screen, it, it, there's times that I can remember in the past that I've been really antagonistic towards the stand at some points. Now I see a man that is, it's like he's getting older and it's, it's getting harder for him to do some things. And I look at it and I see where I might be someday, where a father would be or a friend or somebody we know would be someday. And I and really can't help but watch him and instead of thinking, oh, well, you know, like some of us are, I feel great a great swell of pity and, and sorrow for where he's at in life. And I feel a great sorrow for where our nation's at. And, you know, I'm just, I'll say some things here, and you don't have to agree with me. I promise you, you don't have to agree with me, and you probably don't. When they showed pictures of this kid that shot, uh, tried to shoot the president and shot other people, and people died. A da dad died this, this week. That saddened me to know. I was saddened for that family. I was saddened for that kid that got on the deal. Now, you might not be. You might be angry. I'm not trying to tell you how you have to feel. But I'm telling you, it was a great sense of, of pity I felt. I felt bad. I thought, what, what had to be the background of that kid's life to bring him to the point that he feels like that's the answer? Did he have the, the same upbringing I would have had? Did he have the same things that our little kids have got? What was the upbringing like? I felt pity. I felt bad. I felt saddened. I didn't feel great, great pride about anything. Or I felt saddened. I think, I'm not saying I'm anything, anything good or bad or whatever. I'm just saying that there ought to be something about Christianity that's different than the rest of this world. The things we're seeing ought to sadden us. They ought to drive us to our knees to want to pray. It are, are not drive us to be prideful. It are drive us to be pitiful. We want to live out the gospel. Go back to Philippians chapter number one. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That ye, the next thing I want you to see is you stand fast in one spirit, one mind. I wrote down next, if I was making notes for this, the, their conversation, but the next one I have their cooperation. You need to be together in this. I think, listen, I think if your, if your mindset was the gospel, you would have no problems with being together. Because it wouldn't be about you anymore. It would be about others. It would be about Christ. Stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. 
He says in chapter 2, watch this with me really quick. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, you couldn't fit more things in there. You've got love and you've got mercy and you've got fellowship and consolation and comfort, all that stuff in there. If that's in there, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. That's, I want to be the praise. I want to have the power. I want to have the preeminence. No, no, no. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. We've made everything about our self-esteem, but it's really about esteeming others better than ourselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now watch now, what is he telling you? He's giving you the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Was buried and rose again. You know what? Let that mind be in you. Let that mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. In the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He wasn't looking for his own self. Made himself of no reputation. It's not about my reputation or who I am. He says, it took upon him the form of a servant. Became a servant. Made in the likeness of men, being found in the fashion of men. He humbled himself. How many of us humble ourselves? How many of us are more concerned with being a servant than we are a reputation? Became obedient in the death, even the death of the cross. I'm just telling you, there needs to be a common cooperation, and that would happen if we cared more about each other and about God than we did about ourselves. Somebody said this one time, and I thought it was very good. Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way. Self-forgetful way. That even when I kneel to pray, my prayer should be for others. Others, Lord, yet others, let this my motto be, that I may live for others, that I might live like Thee. He lived for others. And not only a, a, a common, like a cooperation here, but I want you to see the cause. Look at it. It was a common cause they had. Stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. They were striving together. Do you remember I, I preached to you the other day in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it was on Father's Day. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going I'm to read something to you, and you'll remember it. It's a very famous section of Scripture. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, which... Oddly enough, as a, a section of Scripture that talks about selflessness as, a, as opposed to being selfish. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said this, To the weak became I weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partakers thereof with you. He, who to be partake, listen, and we talked about running a race the other day. This is what he says. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And then he says this, And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. He said, I want to be a partaker together with you. Now, that's what I said the other day. I want you to see this very small thing I want you to get. That Paul said the race he was running was that I'm running against Richard, and I want to beat Richard out. No, that's not what he said. What he was talking about is this. I need to realize, if I want to run my race so that God says, well done, then I don't run something about me. That's what he talked about. That's what 1 Corinthians 9 was about. It's not, I'm not going to make my race about me. What he says is, if I want to finish with well done, it'll be because I set myself aside for the good of somebody else. That's what 1 Corinthians 9 is about. It's not about, I'm going to run my race, I just want to beat Nathan. If I get to the finish line before Nathan, and I got more things at the end, more notches on my belt when I get to the end, then he's going to say, well done. I think what you're going to see at the end of the race is the one that helped everybody else win their race is the one that's going to be well done. Paul says, I become all things to all people. That's what he was striving for, to make sure somebody else made it to the end. It's not striving for that. So that I can be a partaker of something that was bigger than me with you. And now in Philippians, he said, I'm striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together. We're striving together for something bigger than us. I'm going to make a statement to you. I, I thought this was interesting. I found this. A draft horse. We've got horse experts here. A draft horse. They pull things. A draft horse, what I found, this is very interesting, and I'll, I'll try to shut us down with this. A draft horse, horse can pull 
something like 8,000 pounds. Drag, 8,000 pounds. Now, you would think if one draft horse can pull 8,000 pounds, that two could pull, for all the mathematicians in a room, would be twice that, 16,000 pounds. That's what you'd think, right? Actually, two together can pull 24,000 pounds. Three times what an individual ho uh, horse can pull. All right, but if they're trained together to work together, they can actually pull somewhere around 32,000 pounds. That's four times as much as a single can pull. Now, what is this called? What is this? What is this? For the, the really smart people in the room, the way smarter than me, I had to look this up. It's called synergy. Did you say synergy? Smart. Smart people. It took me like 15 minutes just to look up what synergy means and make sure I had that right. Synergy. What is synergy? I already asked the smart people in the room to give us these things here. What is synergy? Synergy, listen, is created when things work in concert together to create an outcome that is in some way of more value. The working together it's, has more value than the total of what the individual's input is. So all you smart people know, it's the total of the two the total of the two is greater than the sum of the individual parts. You've heard that before. Synergy, meaning this, that Bobby as a sold out Christian can do a lot for God with the power of the Holy Spirit. Living the life that's the gospel, the death of the old, the burial of the old, and the, the resurrection of a new man. He can do a lot for Christ. But you put him together with a Gary Dias. And now, they don't just do twice. They can do quadruple what they can do, especially when they're put together and trained together. You know what? You get an individual here that's sold out for God. You, JJ, you can do some things for God. You could do some things for God. You really could. But you put you and Caleb together and you both get sold out for God, you do way more than you could do by yourself. If we could just, this is what he's saying. Paul's in prison. Paul's thinking about their future. And Paul's, Paul's already resigned himself to this. Hey, this ain't about me. I'm set for the gospel. I don't care if anybody's talking bad about me or not. I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I, I'm just concerned with magnifying Jesus Christ and getting the gospel to people. That's what he's saying. He's already sold out. What he's trying to do is now is provoke everybody else to get that way. What could we do as a church... If we all decided tonight that, yes, I'm saved because I trusted the gospel, but now my life is going to be the gospel. What, what could you do as an individual if you got sold out for Christ? Now, but let me ask you a bigger question. What if our conversation be about Christ, but then what if we started striving together for the faith? And together, a bunch of sold-out people that started living out the gospel. It was no more about Brother Miller. Now it's about children, and it's about the church. What if it, what if it became more than just Brother Aaron? It became, now we're connected together, and Kevin is connected, and we're, we're all part of something. You know what? You couldn't stop this place. You couldn't stop what we could do in this community. If it no, listen, if it no longer became about me, but it came, became about Jesus Christ and about the gospel, you couldn't stop this place. Now, if you start making it about you, wh where's, where's my praise? We ain't going nowhere. I know that's bad English. We're, we're not going anywhere. When you start making it about you, we stop. But the moment you start living out the gospel, which he tells you in the next chapter, is about sacrificing myself for the betterment of somebody else. That's chapter 2. That's the mind that's supposed to be in us. And you can't stop that. And if we can get a church to do that, if we can get individuals to do that, if we can get families to do that. Now I'm going to tell you, with that being said, the last thing he says is the conflict. Verse 28 down through 30. He says, don't be terrified by your adversaries. Can I promise you, listen now, listen real close. 
Some of you that are taking a nap, it's a time to wake up. Here's what you do. If you would live your life for Jesus Christ, if you would start saying now, the old man's dead, old man's buried, new man's resurrected, I'm living for the Lord, and then we got everybody together to start doing it together. Now we've, we're going someplace. But I can promise you, I can promise you this, the moment you guys get excited about being sold out for God and sold out together, <laughs> I promise you, get ready. There'll be something to try to stop you. There'll be something. An adversary will come. And something will try to stop you. You don't let it stop you, though. You, you get your mind thinking the right way. Here's a man, I just preached it this morning. Here's a man that's in prison. He's in prison, and this is what he said. Hey, I'm chained to somebody. Oh, Paul, I feel so bad you're chained to me. He says, don't feel bad for me. Feel bad for that guy. He's chained to me. I'm about to preach him. So I'm going I'm to preach to him all day long. And when six hours is up, they put another guy in. I got fresh meat. <laughs> preach to that guy for six hours. And by the time you get to chapter 4, he says, I want to salute you. And so does the household of Caesar. Man, I was, I was on the roll, but they put me in prison. Yeah, but I'm not going to let the circumstances stop me. The adversaries are not going to frighten me and get me to stop. Families, listen, adversaries, don't, don't let them stop you. Yes, Some of you just finally get sold out, finally get on fire, finally get a decision. I'm going to do something for God. And right away, something tries to stop you. Right away. Some of you young people know it. As soon as you get fired up to do something for God, right away, something tries to stop you. know it. Working with youth, you know it. The second one of them goes to an altar and says, I'm going to do something for God. You can bet before the week's over, something will try to get them off track. Is that right, JJ? Sure. Yeah, amen. Never fails. Yeah. You families, you go to the altar tonight, you say, hey, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put that into practice. I, I know it. I know it. I know it. Now I'm going to wreck it and be so it. I'm going to yield myself to it. I promise you, before you get out of here, something will try to knock you off track. Devin, am I, am I saying the truth? Something will try to stop you. But what he says is you don't let it stop you. He said, you've seen the same thing. You saw it in me and I kept on going. And now you hear it to be so in me. You keep going. I wish I could make all of us get a hold of this tonight. I don't want you to just hear it. I want you to leave here holding on to it. I don't want you to just hear it. I want you to leave here holding on to it. Because I promise you, you're going to have to put this into practice. See, again... And leave it with this. You know it. How many of you know you're saved? Yeah. You need to know your old man's buried, a, a, a dead, buried, and, and risen with Christ. You know that, right? How many of you know that? Amen. You better start wrecking it to be so. Yes, you better start believing it. I don't care if you've got to write it in the mirror in your bathroom. You are dead. <laughs> you are buried. I don't care what you've got to do. You need to, you need to get it in your mind that that's who you are now. When it raises up and says, you know, you ought to start doing something. You ought to say, you better be quiet. You're dead. You don't, you don't get to tell me what to do anymore. Now, if we could do that, and then we all started doing that, son, there'd be no stopping us. Now, the conflict will come, but we're not going to let it stop us. Just like Paul didn't let him stop them. Same thing for us. Just stand on our feet. Lord God, Father, we love you and we thank you tonight for your word and the truth that's in it. I pray you'd help us to live out the truths of it. Lord, I, I thank you that Paul said so many times, you need to know it, know it, know it, and then reckon it and yield it. Father, I pray you'd help us to reckon it and yield it. I pray that we would see every result of getting a hold of truth of Scripture, not the preacher, but the truth of your Scripture and the power that's found in your Spirit, that we'd be able to live the gospel in our life, and then we'd be in the unity striving together for the gospel. There was no telling what we could do in this place if we just all had that same spirit. Bless us, Lord, and help us. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. She's going to play, give you a chance to pray tonight.